This is BBC Television from Scotland. And this is breaking 100 years of news as we celebrate a centenary of the BBC broadcasting in Scotland. Yay! Yes, we will be looking back across the decades at the big stories making all the headlines. And joining me are award-winning blind comedian Jamie McDonald and broadcaster Kate Adams. And facing them are comedian Joe Caulfield and stand-up Stuart Mitchell. Yay! This show has been extended to a 45-minute special to celebrate 100 years of BBC Scotland and to give the detector fans longer to catch those watching it without a TV licence. <laughs> yes, during the past 100 years of news, Scotland has had five first ministers, five monarchs and 20 prime ministers, or 20 and a half if you count Liz Truss. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, the BBC was founded on the Rethian principles, which are to inform, educate and entertain. However, the values were updated in the early 2010s and now pledged to inform, educate, entertain and shoehorn Claudia Winkleman into absolutely everything. <laughs> right, we have got 100 years of highlights to get through, so let's crack on with round one. <laughs> Now, in this round, we've broken up four decades of news and we'll be giving each of our panellists some clues to our main stories. So, Kay, you're up first and we're going right back to the 1920s. What do you think is being talked about here? An advertisement was put in the Glasgow Herald by the BBC in London asking for a station director for Glasgow with a knowledge of radio. Well, all the people who applied had all the qualifications except that none of them knew anything about radio except my organist, Mr Carruthers. So he got the job and naturally we were all involved. I was called in to help with advising on programmes and pronouncing the names of Italian arias and things like that. Is that Kathleen Garskaden? That is a great spot. Well Thank done. Thank you. Yes, you saw and heard there from broadcaster Kathleen Garskaden, who was there right at the start. On the 6th of March, 1923, Station 5 SC began broadcasting from Glasgow as part of the British Broadcasting Company. The small attic space in Bath Street often housed an orchestra, pipe band, choir, actors and speech makers as BBC Scotland took shape, sending news, current affairs, sport and entertainment into people's homes. Scotland's first radio broadcast took place right there in 1923 in Glasgow and radio quickly became popular, overtaking Glasgow's previous preferred method of communication, shouting. <laughs> <laughs> Every broadcast began with a pipe band. Really? Yes, they did, which I would like to reintroduce, actually. I would like to start my morning show with a pipe band. Is I that, think that, is that why be... they moved out the attic? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't you get them up the wee stairs? <laughs> yeah. The guy in the flat below must have been raging. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pipe band always kicked it off? Absolutely, get everybody's attention. As you say, you know, there was people crammed into this small attic, an orchestra, a choir, the speech writers. It was kind of like 10 Downing Street during lockdown, really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, marvellous. Oh, that great 1923 works event that we remember. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's spooky, you have to say. Absolutely. And what about you, Jamie McDonald? Yes. Take you back oh, yeah. into your thoughts on what those first broadcasts would have been like. If it was a new thing, who had a radio? <laughs> this is very true. Yeah. Tell to nobody. Just somewhere listening going, oh, Marconi's loving this. <laughs> <laughs> He hates the pipes. <laughs> he hates the pipes. <laughs> Absolutely raging. Stuart, what about you? Thinking back to that 100 years ago, can you imagine what those first broadcasts would have been like? Well, it's my, I, I never actually knew that all the radio stations went through the post office network. The post office ran the telephone network that the radio stations went through. And I'm wondering, is that, is that, can you believe that? The post office ran the telephone network. Imagine phoning a Chinese on a Saturday night. <laughs> and they put a card through your door to tell you. 
that your salt and chilli chicken is in the neighbour's blue bin. <laughs> We've done a lot in our time, Joe. Innovators in broadcasting. What do you think Scotland has given the world in terms of broadcasting? Dr Finlay, that was a big oh, thing. Dr yes. Finlay's case book with the lady that also did the ad for the floor cleaning. She, oh, now, yeah. this is me and older people will remember. Flash, the Flash woman. What was her name? Jean Molly Weir. Molly Weir, yeah. that's her. You couldn't you call her the Flash woman to her face? No. <laughs> But also there was a whole thing about Dr Finlay all being very innuendo, that everything was, it was all, you know, Dr Finlay's at the back door and it was all sort of, you know. <laughs> Is that what you were saying about us down in England? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we thought. They're going, this is passes for porn in Scotland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it must, have, must have been amazing being able to see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Television today was a lot to Scottish ingenuity. Without the work of two great Scots in the 1920s, there would be no Love Island today. Yes, that's John Logie Baird for the television and Alexander Fleming for the penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Key. You get two points for that. Jamie, here's a slightly easier clue for you from the 1930s. He's Urwally, you're Wally. Abadie's Wally. So, Jamie, you uh, couldn't see the picture. Yeah, it's... it's, <laughs> it's, it's that... <laughs> I, I'm is, now hearing is that... Is saying... that the outbreak of venereal disease? <laughs> <that> started... <laughs> started at the start of the 30s. Yeah, that's... That's the right that's answer. Well impression. done. Uh, the answer I would accept is that's the very first episode of Dr Finley's Casebook. <laughs> Um, that's Ur Willy. <laughs> that is, of course, right, Jamie. Well done. It is Ur Willy, the legend that is Ur Willy. The DC Thompson comic strip was first created in 1936. In the comics, Willy wages a constant war against boredom with his lifelong pals, Fat Bob, Soapy Suter, and Wee Eck, whilst avoiding the watchful eye of PC Murdoch. The Bruins have also had some amazing jobs. Paul worked in the shipyards, Joe was a boxer, and Gordon was Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still going today, or Willie? Really? Our Willie is still going strong. You get Our Willie is still going strong. Yes. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Hi. I'm sure um, Puffin will have something to say about Fat Bob. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, is it? Well, oh, yeah. couldn't be called Fat no. Bob. No. Couldn't be Fat No, no. And well, PC Murdoch used to give Our Willie a clip around the ear. He wouldn't he be doing that either, would he? No. No, no Scottish no, police would never do him. that. No. <laughs> but they would say that Our Willie, it wasn't really his fault because he's got ADHD. So. Ah. It wouldn't also be called our Willie. It would be called uh, our gender neutral private part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved our Willie and I really loved the Bruins as well. It's not realistic. I mean, how many? They're for Dundee and they've got eight kids all at the same day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope they were married or Kate Forbes would be furious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we leave the topic of Ur Willie, you mentioned it briefly there, Joe. Were you aware of Ur Willie? Yeah, I, cause, yeah, because there, there, there would be at the annual. I think yeah. my brother had the annual, but I, I was never sure if he was a, a child or a little old man, because he, <laughs> he looked, he's, he's a little old man or a child that doesn't look very well, because he's all sort of scrunched and that. So I thought, oh, I don't want to read the cartoon about the little old man that sit on, sits on a bucket all day. No. <laughs> Sounds a bit tragic. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon used an image of Ur Willie on a charity Christmas card in 2016. The wee tour rag was pictured sitting on a bucket uh, with Ur Willie just peeking over her shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be quite nice to Nicola, and we're hoping for her as a guest at some point. <laughs> this rate, maybe the host. <laughs> So there we go, well done for getting it right, talking about our Willie then into the Bruins. But what other stories have we spotted from the 1930s? Oh, it has to be 1933 when the Inverness Courier reported someone seeing a beast at Loch Ness. <laughs> and so started a £40 million pound yearly tourist industry. <laughs> <laughs> because some, somebody thought, I think I saw something. 
Yes, on April the 14th, 1933, the Inverness Courier did indeed publish the first reported sightings of a beast in Loch Ness. One excited local said, I couldn't believe it. It looked exactly like all the magnets and postcards I sell in the shop. <laughs> 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 and in 1938, MI5 arrested Jesse Jordan, who was a Dundee hairdresser, later convicted as a German spy. It's unclear what gave away Jesse's true identity, but historians suspect it's something to do with the fact that she opened her salon up at four in the morning just to put towels on the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Jamie. That's another two points for you. Now we're on to you, Joe. We're into the 1940s. And can you tell me what this Edinburgh Rami is all about? The mound, uh, the traditional meeting place of Edinburgh people's below me, they're dancing at some reels now there. Fireworks are going on all over the place. There are a few persistent trams making a very slow progress along Princess Street now, but I don't think they'll be able to go on very much longer. The Scots are supposed to be uh, a slow lot, but when they do start, uh, they start. And if I know anything about this town, it's, uh, it's going on uh, for a long time yet. So it was, uh, it was VE Day, uh, which is after VD Day, which yeah. isn't as popular. <laughs> right? and so it's the end of the war, so everybody went out dancing, and it was a great time. But there must have also been some women who are going, oh, God, he's going to come back now, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> what a good time we were having. <laughs> it was all Those Americans, so... yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, That's brilliant. Well done, Joe. That's the right answer. Yes, it's the joy, the relief, the happiness, and even a hint of disbelief of VE Day right here in Scotland. On the 8th of May of 1945, Prime Minister Winston Churchill made an announcement on the radio that the war in Europe had indeed come to an end. On June the 6th, of 1944, Brits and Americans landed in Normandy, marking the final time to date that French people would be happy to see them. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be very few cocktails at the party because of the rationing. Um, it's kind of one banana daiquiri per village. <laughs> um, but, and I, and I, I don't know, I mean, Scots, we need two back-to-back -back bank holidays to get over Hugman 8. <laughs> How, how many did they get for defeating the Nazis? <laughs> Uh, there we go. Uh, that was, of course, reflections on World War II and how the end of it was celebrated here in Scotland. Uh, we're staying in the era of the 1940s. What other news from that decade, Stuart, has caught your eye? Probably 1945, when the RMS Queen Mary took the 15,000 American troops home. Uh, I mean, they had to use the Navy because the Carmack Ferry was in for repairs. <laughs> <laughs> Big moment, of course, iconic as well. Kay, what about you? We're talking about the 1940s and that decade. What other news stories are you drawn to from that period? And the deputy German Führer, Rudolf Hess, yes, parachuted into Scotland. Um, well, I mean, the story is that he was looking for the 14th Duke of Hamilton, but everyone knows he was looking for... Um, Wo ist Jesse Jordan? <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> ich need a wee trim. <laughs> In 1941, the SS politician loaded with 264,000 bottles of whiskey ran aground in Eriskay. Bottles were hidden all over the island by locals and are now worth a fortune under the 20p bottle deposit scheme. <laughs> <laughs> And there we go, two points for Joe. Well done to you, and we'll hand over to you now, Stuart. You get actual moving pictures of a dramatic crime scene from the 1950s. On Christmas morning, the stone was gone. The Dean of Westminster called the disappearance an act of sacrilege and spoke of the stone as a precious relic treasured by millions throughout the British Commonwealth. These initials, JFS, apparently newly scratched on the chair, are thought to stand for justice for Scotland and support the theory that the stone's disappearance is the work of extreme Scottish nationalists. Well, this is a theft of the stony destiny, isn't it? 
is the right answer. Well done. Yes, indeed, Stuart, that's the right answer. It was the crime that rocked the nation back at the start of the 1950s. On Christmas Day of 1950, Scottish nationalists stole the Stone of Destiny from Westminster Abbey, where it had been kept since Edward I took it from Schoon in 1286. Then, on the 11th of April, 1951, the stone was left in the ruins of Arbroath Abbey and later taken back to London before eventually being officially returned to Scotland in 1996, 710 years after it happened had been taken. It's very, sounds like, you know, students nowadays, they'd be like, oh, they've got all TikTok and they've got all these things and they, they oh, in our day, we had to steal a stone for amusement. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, but the, the thing is that we don't talk about very, they completely cocked it up. I mean, this was a very daring raid to reclaim, as you say, the stone of destiny and they got in there and, you know, they, they managed to sort of fool the guard that was there and sneaked in. And then they broke the bloody thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? They don't talk about that very much, do they? So the first attempt was they, they took out a wee kind of curling stone. And then, so that's not going to look very impressive coming back over the border, is it? Look, we've got a half brick. <laughs> <laughs> it was the suffragettes that broke it. They let off a bomb. Always blame the women. And it cracked it. Yeah. Oh, genuinely. <laughs> they, let, they let off a bomb and it cracked it in two and they only noticed when they tried to nick it and it fell apart. How did I only get a D for higher history? <laughs> Uh, as you correctly identified, this was a story that represents student life. It was students who, in fact, did this. So, let's ask our panel this question. What was your most memorable thing that you did when you were a student? Well, it was regrettable. Um, I, was, I was at Aberdeen at uni and I, I was... The, the... Very regrettable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, uh, I was their only blind boxer. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying to a guy in the ring, look, don't, don't go easy on me just because I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> he kicked the shit out of me. <laughs> and that is the most memorable thing you did as a student. I only remembered it yesterday. <laughs> Well, there we go. The Stone of Schoon is sometimes known as the Stone of Destiny, which is also the name Slimming World give to that last £14 before your goal weight. <laughs> There we go, that is us flowing through 40 years so far, and at the end of that round, the teams are all square. <laughs> now, much of our news is about public opinion, so we've asked a couple of broadcasting legends to help frame our next two decades. Kay and Jamie, here's Gaelic superstar Cathy McDonald. What story do you think Cathy is on about here? Well, I mean, it was momentous. I mean, this was like the Olympics, if you think about it. I mean, there was a huge race to be first. And it's one of these moments that for some people, not myself, I have to add, who can remember where they were when it happened. Uh, it's the moon landing. The moon landing is the correct answer. Well done, Jamie. It is indeed the moon landing as mankind finally reached the lunar surface in 1969. Here's a quick look at the historic touchdown. Tranquility base here. Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility, we copy on the ground. Uh, there you go, that's the Apollo 11 space flight which saw astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin become the first people to land on the moon. An estimated 650 million people worldwide were glued to a television set somewhere watching Neil Armstrong take humanity's first steps on another celestial body. And of those, an estimated 16 million were in the UK. The moon, of course, has a dark side that we never get to see, much like Lorraine Kelly. <laughs> I think they missed a trick, you know, because there's all the, you know, the conspiracy theories that, that came out about it, you know, that it never happened and it was in a basement and stuff. They, they could have got so much more out of that by going, you know, it's one giant step, it's one... What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> Just... <laughs> Just in the background, yeah. exterminate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did anybody else hear that? <laughs> yeah, would have added to it. What do you think about this then, Kay? We always talk about iconic moments. This is maybe it. This is the one. How momentous was the moon landing? Um, to my great shame, and I do remember it, actually, um, I wasn't that interested, and it's a bizarre reason that I wasn't interested. It's because I hated the clangers. <laughs> and I, I kind of thought, that's the same as the clangers, and I really don't <laughs> like the clangers, so I'm, I'm not watching it. It was on after 9 o'clock. 
I mean, it wasn't scheduled television, but it, I know, so it was staying up late. That was the only thing I remember. I'm allowed to stay up late because there's something that the adults are excited about. <laughs> and it was really funny to watch that clip because it wasn't the actual moon landing. And I had a memory and I thought, why would I remember that? And it's because that's what we saw. What I liked was the control room with all the tellies. And I remember thinking, like, oh, I'd like to do that when I grow up, be in a room with lots of tellies. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what they were doing, but that was what impressed me, like, because you only had one telly, but this was like a room. And as an adult, their job was to look at tellies. <laughs> so that seemed like a great job. And look at you now, Joe. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Stuart, what do you think about this? We're talking about the moon landing, the iconic moment that is. How momentous was it, really? I mean, it's incredible, and I'm really looking... Ex I'm excited about the Scottish spaceports <laughs> coming. I mean, come on, it's, it's airports for rockets, and I don't mean Glasgow Presswick. <laughs> that was pure dead brilliant. <laughs> In 1969, man walked on the moon. Allegedly, of course, skeptics were quick to pipe up, particularly when it was revealed that Neil Armstrong brought back a massive Toblerone from customs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and said his famous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Apparently, it was originally just gonna say, you could see my house feet up here. <laughs> The moon landing is correct. Two points to Kay and Jamie. It's to you now, Joe and Stuart. Your turn as we catch up with an icon of Scottish football, Archie McPherson. What story do you think Archie is talking about here? We had a fantastic propagandist. He was almost like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, leading us all eventually into the river. And I could understand why people were deeply disappointed at home because of the build-up and the expectations. It was as if they were being stabbed in the heart, being let down. I even felt I was letting them down, even though I had nothing to do with what was happening in front of me. There you go, that is Archie McPherson at Wisney Me. Ah. The shaggy defence. <laughs> but what was Archie talking about? What do you think that news item is from the 1970s, Stuart? Oh, it was a failure of Argentina, 78. The Scottish football team. But at the end of the day, we lost one, we drew one, and we won one. In Scottish terms, that's a result. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a result. That is the right answer, Stuart. Well done. Yes, in the 1970s, we genuinely believed we had a team capable of winning the World Cup. <laughs> yes, here's manager Ali McLeod and some of his superstar players getting an unbelievable send-off. Ali McLeod himself led the parade of 22 players onto the pitch. For Kenny Dalglish on his second World Cup campaign, a rapturous reception. Gordon McQueen, Britain's most expensive player, limped out painfully amid the cheers, still recovering from his recent injury. And last of all, Derek Johnston, scorer of Scotland's only two goals in the home championships. A night then to remember. And lovely of them to take their sleeping bags with them. <laughs> for that journey. What a moment that was when you look at it. A crowd fueled by hope, passion, delusion and tenants lager. <laughs> <laughs> when ITN's Trevor McDonald asked, what will you do if you win the World Cup? Ali McLeod replied, retain it. <laughs> As it was, here's what happened. We beat Holland 3-2. We were roundly beaten 3-1 by Peru and drew 1-1 with Iran to crash out of the tournament. Archie Gemmell's wonder goal against Holland saw him breeze past four Dutchmen without them laying so much as a finger on him. A feat only equaled in 2022 when Lewis Capaldi made it through customs at Schiphol Airport. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I could see you reacting as you watched that. Well, what I, did you make of that? Well, they were never going to win because they, had, they only had three players. <laughs> But, I mean, I admire your spirit, but... <laughs> but they were that good. <laughs> they could have won the lot of it. Stuart, those pictures are amazing and those memories, of course, invoked for all of us Scottish football fans. Why do you think it was that we thought Scotland could win the World Cup? Well, because Liverpool had just won the European Cup and they had, like, Ksunis, Dalglish, Hansen. So we were a decent team and clearly the year before we beat England 2-1 at Wembley and we, we took some turf and goalposts and... <laughs> <laughs> I think they were later found at uh, our bro Fabby. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's, incre what's incredible is we always sort of balance and nothing can be perfect because even though Archie Gemmell, that goal was probably the best Scottish international goal, 
but saying that, he still managed to nutmeg one of his own players. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Just showed off, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, great moments, great memories. All of that hope and the nation, just so excited about it. Kay, what do you think it was? What was in the air at that time that made us think we could win the World Cup? Oh, I don't know. You've always got a hope, haven't you? You know, hope springs eternal. And I mean, I remember it. So I actually find it quite difficult to kind of laugh about it because I do remember it quite clearly. Um, and the excitement up to the point that we were papped out um, was just incredible. <laughs> and I, I remember watching Archie Gemmell's goal. I remember where I was, you know. Don't remember much of that decade, but I do remember that. <laughs> um, See, that's probably our moon landing. Yeah. Like the Archie Gemmel goal. Oh, my God. That's a it moment. Was, it was amazing, wasn't it? And, you know, you better to look forward for th to things and think that you might make it, and then you enjoy all of that, or do you say, oh, we're never going to win, we're never going to win, and then you're miserable from the get-go. There you go. So I like the Scottish way of doing it. We had the hope, we had the best fans, as you say. It didn't quite bring home the trophy, but what a moment in history for us, Jamie, there. Just hearing that and hearing the crowd and the expectation from the manager, why was it? Why did we think we could win the World Cup that year? Well, because you had the winning ceremony before you left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a television company offered Ali McLeod an all-expenses-paid trip to watch Peru before the tournament, but he turned it down. Yes, the free trip to Peru was instead taken by Diego Maradona. <laughs> Armed with nothing more than a plane ticket and a rolled-up £20 note. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we're talking about stories from the 1970s. Any other stories from the 70s that grab you? 1973, the film The Wicker Man, which I loved. It's a great film. Really, uh, I, I could watch it again and again. But I do feel it gave people the wrong idea about what the weather was like in the summer in Scotland. <laughs> that you could quite happily dance naked at night, whereas I never go out without a cardi, really. <laughs> To be fair, they didn't light a big fire. That's true, they had a fire. There was some balance in there. He was roasting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Scotland's magical mystery tour to Argentina and back is the right answer. Two points go to Stuart and Joe. <laughs> Now, this round is all about who's in the news. I will play you a clip of a mystery person who featured prominently in the news from a particular year. All you have to do is tell me who it is. So, Kay and Jamie, it's 1980. Who is this and why are they in the news? Luck doesn't take you everywhere. And I think I've worked fairly hard this year. And um, everyone around me, I know, has worked hard. And I think that using the luck and combining it with hard work, that's what helps you get anywhere. Oh, some profound statements, but who does that voice belong to? Kay? Well, she doesn't sound like that now, does she? No, no, no. no. My baby takes the morning drink, <laughs> and it's Sheena Easton. Kay says Sheena Easton. Let's see if she's right with this amazing bit of footage. Come on, Sheena. We'll do it all again, saying hello. Very nice to see you again. That's a Southwide spa. What do you keep you warm when you're not doing very well? <laughs> Thank you. Just what I need. And when you're doing very well, that's a letter on the top of your family. Oh, that's lovely. Thanks very much. There we go. Pop star Sheena Easton got her big break on a 1980 edition of The Big Time, a documentary series where each episode followed an aspiring star. After being advised to avoid drugs by celebrity coach Dusty Springfield, Easton went on to record a Bond theme, Have a Fling with Prince, and prompt the introduction of parental advice advisory stickers on explicit records. No bad going. Esther Ranson made Sheena Easton famous, though not as famous as a carrot shaped like a penis or a dog saying sausages. Uh, <laughs> well done for getting the right answer, Kay. So are you a big fan of Sheena Easton, Kay? Well, I remember watching that at the time, and I mean, it was it was huge news, because, I mean, talent shows, of course, now we're really used to them, but that was one of the very, very kind of early ones. And, I mean, Sheena Easton for Bell's Hill going out with Prince... I mean, it was, forget the moon landing, my <laughs> God. It was incredible. And then, of course, poor Sheena, she took so much stick for the accent because she sounded like a kind of uh, original self there, but she got more and more sort of transatlantic <laughs> and uh, she fell into the Lulu trap, which uh, I think people then, it was, oh, Sheena, and then it was, oh, Sheena. <laughs> She's Get forgotten her roots. Sheena, yeah. Oh, that's she what they did. said. But an absolute superstar back in the day. Do you think Prince ever said Sheena? Show me Bell's Hill. 
I will, Prince, I will. One day. Yeah, one yeah. day. You will return there. Uh, Stuart, what about you? Are you a fan of Sheena Easton? Yes, I am. We were both born in Bell's Hill Maternity Hospital. <gasps> yes, that's where our similarities end. <laughs> Interesting fact. Do you know she was the first Bond theme singer to ever appear in the opening credits of a 007 film? Ooh. There you go. Didn't know that song. Which is dangerous, cos he brings a gun at. <laughs> It's interesting, our, our song 95 had to be changed, didn't it? Cos Dolly Parton yeah. had to change 95. It was called the Backy 10. <laughs> 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 uh, well done for getting the right answer. Yes, of course, we're talking about Sheena Easton. Now, not only is it a great song, but Sheena Easton's Bond theme, For Your Eyes Only, is also a decisive answer to the question, should I drive to Barnard Castle? <laughs> 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 Dominic Cummings in the audience tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I always associate Sheena Easton with Esther Ranson, as whenever my mum put one of her albums on and started singing along, I felt like calling Childline. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've covered Sheena Easton there, but what other story from the 1980s do you think is the most interesting one we should be talking about and why? I'll go to you, Kay. The Glasgow Garden Festival, because that was the year that I came back to Glasgow because I've been living in Birmingham for four or five years. Um, so this was my first summer back in Glasgow and it was transformed, wasn't it? It was brilliant. Oh my God, I loved it so much. And of course, I just joined STV as a news reporter. And so I was sent out to the Garden Festival, I think every day for however long it was on for, I don't know, it was three or four months. And it was magical, actually. It really was. It was transformed. The big guy on the stilts. Remember the big guy on the stilts? Yes, I do. And I remember the roller coaster as well. Yes. And absolutely. I remember I met Paul Coya. <laughs> that was my highlight. Did you meet Debbie Greenwood? I didn't meet Debbie. Ah, well, see, that doesn't count. <laughs> um, do you remember there was a, a big fat papi and mashy lady? Yeah. Um, and there was a wee guy, so they were quite kind of famous at statues. I bought the big fat lady. Because afterwards, after it all was dismantled, they had this sad old warehouse out in Hillington where some the various sort of exhibits that hadn't been claimed were left and they put them up for auction. And I loved this lady. I saw her every day and so I bought her and she is in my front room right now oh. watching this on the telly. There you go. Oh. That's brilliant. My mum took my brother and I to the Garden Festival the first time. We were excited, so we got up uh, close to it, and there was the wee, there was a wee train, like yeah. a wee kind of yes. more, more train. We got in it, so I was really excited, and it drove us right back out to the car park. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have bought a ticket then. Yeah. You've <laughs> been dealt, Jamie. Uh, 80s, I think, is a great era, one which we're all pretty uh, fresh with in terms of memories. Mm -hmm. What, for you, Jamie, is a story from the 1980s you think is really interesting and that we should be talking about? Well, the big one, the Berlin Wall fell in, in 1989. 89 it was, yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, I can't remember, we, I, was, I was nine, but I remember, it's, I think it was seven, and we went to Austria on holiday because we're middle class. And <laughs> um, there was a big lake slash loch that kind of straddled between Austria and Hungary. And we were swimming in it, and the German guy said, no, don't, don't swim out too far. And I said, why, why, is it deep? He said, no, no, you'll be shot. <laughs> <laughs> Great memories, and as you say, some iconic moments. We're talking about the 1980s. Stuart, what story from that decade sticks out for you? In 1980, the Singer Sewing Machine Factory closed in Clyde Bank. Very personal to me, because my great-great auntie Jean worked there and then my dad had a Singer sewing machine shop in Edinburgh. And uh, so that was really personal. Mm. And I was great at sewing at school as well. Remember home economics? You would do half baking and half sewing. <laughs> and all my, all my classmates, after two weeks, they'd be struggling with a pillowcase and I'd made a double duvet in matching curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the family proud, Stuart. We love that. What an era it was. What a decade, the 1980s. So much happened at that time. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989, bringing iconic images of thousands of East Germans scrambling over the wall back in East Germany after hearing David Hasselhoff singing. <laughs> Yes, two points to Kay and Jamie, that Scottish singing sensation, Sheena Easton. Right over to you, Joe and Stuart now. We're into the 90s, so who is this? 
Yeah. Well, if you say, uh, if you're inviting me to uh, proclaim myself a latter-day Ian Smith, um, uh, the answer is not a role I would ever want in any sense. Uh, I believe in winning at the ballot box. Well, there we go, a very famous voice from that decade for Scotland. Joe, do you recognise it? I don't recognise the voice, but only from what he's saying, I think I know who it is. But what a, what a speech pattern he's got. Yeah. I wouldn't argue with him. No. No. It's quite it... formidable, quite unique. Yeah, just... Is it Donald Dewar? Donald Dewar, uh, well, we're seeing Donald Dewar. Let's see if we're right, Joe. The de bill delivers the policy endorsed by three quarters of those who voted the referendum. This is a government that keeps its promises. The people uh, voted for a parliament in Edinburgh and this, this Scotland bill is the pathway to that parliament. Clause one of the bill could not be more definitive. There shall be a Scottish parliament. <gasps> I like that. <laughs> there we go. What a moment that was. Well done. Uh, yes, well done, that is correct. As Donald Dewar announcing that there would indeed be a Scottish Parliament following a resounding yes vote in the 1997 referendum. On the 1st of July 1999, the modern Scottish Parliament was officially opened by the Queen in its temporary home, the General Assembly Hall in the Mound in Edinburgh. Legislative powers were transferred from Westminster and Donald Dewar became the First Minister of the Scottish Executive, the devolved Scottish Government. Donald Dewar earned the title Father of the Nation for his role in devolution whereas Boris Johnson earned the same title for completely different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but a big moment in recent Scottish history, no doubt. Kay, how significant was that vote for a devolved parliament? Uh, well, it was hugely significant, of course, and, you know, looking at Donald Dewar there, um, as you say, formidable person, Joe Colquhoun. I think he was also, you know, hugely respected across the, the political spectrum. Of course, his statue is outside the Buchanan Galleries at the top of uh, Buchanan Street in Glasgow. And, you know, every time I pass it, I mean, I certainly do look up at it and I think, what would that look like with a traffic cone on its head? <laughs> So, clearly very significant. It definitely is. One day he'll reach that. That's iconic status. Uh, Jamie, what about you? We're talking about a huge moment for Scotland. How significant was that vote for devolution and a devolved parliament? I mean, wow. <laughs> Just huge. Matt, without, without that parliament, um, there would never be all the train station signs in Gaelic. <laughs> and I'd never know what Rutherglen, how Rutherglen is said in Lewis. <laughs> So it's had a real life yeah, effect in yeah, Eugene. Yeah, real huge mass. Rutherglen. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, Des, because it's really important, I think the biggest achievement for the Scottish Parliament genuinely was scrapping NHS hospital parking fees. I, I, I think that was massive, because even here, the, the Royal Hospital for Children, for example, it's only a 10-minute walk to the hydro. <laughs> 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 Everyone at home making a note of that one. <laughs> yes, well done for getting the right answer. We identified Donald Dewar there. In 1999, the modern Scottish Parliament was officially opened by the Queen in its temporary home, the General Assembly Hall in the Mound in Edinburgh. They had to move out a month later, though, because the Cambridge Footlights had booked it up for the fringe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what about yourself? Do you have any other stories from the 90s that we can talk about? Well, 1996 uh, put where I live on the map. Train spotting came out. And I live in Leith, and that's how I have to describe it. If you say to people like down south, you where do you love to see Leith? Do you know train spotting? That's where it is, and they go, oh my god. <laughs> um, uh, but I say to them, and like the Porter Leith bar that's that, that's in the film, and that and that still the, looks the same. And you go in there, but it's it's changed because you go in there and you go, oh, there's all these middle class English people in there. But other than that, you know, <laughs> other than me and my friends, it's a delight. <laughs> um, but, uh, but but no, I, that's a special place, and I didn't I didn't a special film, and then I didn't realise, oh, now I'd end up living there in years to come. And it still has that feel and that mix. It's an interesting area. Yeah. And it's, it's got a sort of creativity and it's got, I always say, like, it, there's great little bars and stuff. Like, if you enjoy, like, an organic craft beer, you know, but with the freeze on, there could be a glassing at any moment. It's the place <laughs> for you. I love it. What a way to sell it.
The first Tea in the Park music festival took place in 1994. Remember it at Strathclyde Country Park? Amazing to think that was nearly 30 years ago. And the guy who was at the back of the queue has now just finally reached the toilets yesterday. <laughs> Founding father of the devolved Scottish Parliament, Donald Dewar, is the right answer. Two points go to Stuart and Joe. <laughs> and it's time now for our final quick fire round, focusing on everything from the year 2000 up until right now. I will read out a story from the last 30 years to bring us up to date, and all the teams have to do is fill in the blanks. So get ready, teams. When we run out of time, you'll hear this. This is the Scottish Home Service, and for the hundredth time, it's all yours. And thank you very much for that handover. That was indeed showbiz legend Jimmy Logan there. And the thing you have to ask yourself is, how did he know that we'd be here doing this 100-year <laughs> celebration? <laughs> A soothsayer, I tell you. Right, fingers and buzzers, and here we go. In 2002, what took 14 days, 19 hours and 51 minutes? <laughs> Jamie. A fortnight. <laughs> we should just give him the points for that. In 2002, what took 14 days, 19 hours and 51 minutes? <laughs> Joe Caulfield. A photo to download from the internet. <laughs> I think that's the same now, isn't it? <laughs> In 2002, what took 14 days, 19 hours and 51 minutes? <laughs> Kay Adams. The first non-stop trip around the world by balloon. The answer is that the first non-stop trip around the world ah. via balloon took exactly that time, and well done to Kay Adams. <laughs> Now, you either love balloons or you've read my auto QK. <laughs> Option B. I love you anyway. I'll give you the points. Don't you worry. Right, fingers back on your buzzers. In 2021, a Scot won what for the very first time? K. A watch. Uh. <laughs> After being told for years. You've won a watch. Somebody finally did it. I love that answer. Bonus point for that. Though it's something else we're looking for from recent news. Big event, actually. In 2021, a Scot won what for the very first time? <laughs> Jamie. Compensation for getting sunburned and hard in the murchin. <laughs> well, there's a blame, there's a claim. Brilliant <laughs> answer. In 2021, a Scot won what for the very first time? <laughs> Stuart. Is that a Ryanair scratch card? <laughs> <laughs> That's pure fiction, mate. Nobody's ever won that. In 2021, a Scot won what for the very first time? K. I I think I actually do genuinely know this one. You might have interviewed him as well. World's Strongest Man? Oh, well done. That's oh. the right answer, yes. It was Tom Stoltman who won the World's Strongest Man. First time the title has come to Scotland. This is the Scottish Home Service, and for the hundredth time, it's all yours. Oh, there we go. That is the Claxon. Jimmy has Logan, meaning it's all over. And at the end of the quiz, our winners are... It's Jamie McDonald and Kay Adams! <laughs> So close. So let's hear commiserations for our runners up Stuart Mitchell and Joe Caulfield. <laughs> Thanks to global warming and rising sea levels, breaking 200 years of the news will be coming from the Scottish capital on the tropical island of Stirling. <laughs> <laughs> We will see you back here for breaking 200 years of the news. Hopefully by then, round one will be about when people used to use food banks. Round two will be how Scotland led the successful fight against climate change. And round three will be about how fed up England are here in us, Scotland, talking about winning the World Cup in 2066. <laughs> One hundred years of the news is broken. I've been Des Clark. Goodbye. Yeah.